achieving total health that's an interesting title because i find that the word total is being used more and more in western societies i have sometimes wondered in what context the word total is used maybe we have different connotations of this word we might get it out of our way by defining what we mean by total i saw a play many years ago in broadway which was described as total play so i was very curious to see what a total play looks like when i went inside i found that all the characters were on the stage at the same time there was no entry and exit of any actors and actresses in that play they all stood with the parts written down in their hands and when one actor had to make an entry he would speak out enter caesar then caesar would speak so the movement was also spoken out instead of being acted out and this was called total play well if you can put all the characters together on a stage and say that is total play maybe if you put all the aspects of man together on the health platter you could say that is total health how many characters are there in man that need to become healthy first of all there is the physical man that is obvious we can see each other that is our physical body our physical self the entire anatomy of the physical body that requires to be healthy so if physical man is healthy then i suppose he has achieved physical health the second character is the sensory man who is perceiving things through senses and does not necessarily use his body for example the capacity to use imagination a man imaginatively or in his memory walks out meet somebody he met yesterday comes back in imagination that imaginary self is also the self if the imaginary self is suffering from ill health the physical body will also be unhealthy therefore the imaginary self which i might call the sensory self also must be healthy the third is the mental man the mind of man if the mind of man is plagued with the guilt and jealousy and hatred and problems it will affect both the sensory or imaginative man as well as the physical man so the mental man must also be healthy then comes the moral man the man who is asking questions about sin and virtue and punishment and reward he is worried has he done something wrong and the very weight of the question have i done something wrong makes a moral man ill and if the moral man is ill so is the mental man so is the sensory man so is the physical man so a moral man can create ill health even in otherwise physical bodies which are healthy then above the moral man there is the spiritual man the man living in his soul in his spirit the man who is exercising those faculties of the spirit called love intuition experiencing joy and beauty if he is ill in these functions he affects all the men on the rest of the stage then there is a the total man the total man consists of this totality since these men physical sensory mental moral and spiritual since these men all seem to be operating on their own if they operated together all at once they would perhaps be called total man therefore when all is healthy in combination with each other in relation to, to each other in coordination with each other we say the total man is healthy 
I would suggest that to achieve total health, we must build up the total man's health. Achieving total health is no different than having a healthy total man in a healthy spirit, in a healthy mind, in a healthy moral situation, in a healthy sensory perception, in a healthy physical body. If you aren't healthy all the way through, you are not achieving total health. Now, what is it that makes the total man healthy? Let's start from food for the physical man. When physical man is fed food, it influences every other man. When you go and kill an animal and bring him home to eat, you can't help subjecting the subconscious part of the mental man from suffering ill health. There is no way. And if part of your mental self is ill, you cannot have physical health. If you extinguish life of a higher order of intelligence, then is necessary. You are creating ill health in the higher forms of man. Therefore, the first requirement is that food for the physical body should be such as creates the least imbalance, the least adverse pressure from the mental man. I have already spoken in a separate lecture on the vegetarian food and philosophy and I have explained at some length how food affects the subconscious mind of man and how vicarious responsibility is accepted by man for somebody else killing the animal of which the food has been made. That the subconscious is very naughty and not really in favor of the self when it accepts such accountability. Therefore, the health itself is affected. The first step, therefore, is that one should have good, nutritious, balanced, simple, vegetarian, plant life food for the physical body. If that is done, you are laying the basis of good total health. Next comes the sensory man. If you feed your senses with ugliness, misery, trouble, suffering all the time, you cannot expect to be healthy. Therefore, the sensory man must be exposed to beautiful sensory perceptions. Beauty, joy, these things should be seen and lived in and experienced. If you do that, your body is healthy. In fact, if you are seeing beautiful things and if you are feeling cheerful and happy and going through pleasant experiences, the food that the physical body is taking is also being absorbed better. Nutrition is being absorbed in the system only when the higher form of the body is accepting it. Then comes the mental man. If the mind is involved in an intellectual debate and discussion with people, which leads to no result, it is a very frustrating experience. We are creating frustrations for ourselves by endless dispute and argument just because we have an intellect to use. Just because we have an intellect and a mind does not mean that we must use it in that form. It is affecting our health. People have found that when they argue little and love more, their health improves. Whether you are right in your argument or wrong. But if you keep on arguing, trying to prove that you are right and the other is wrong, your health becomes worse even if you are right. Therefore, a use of the human mind in such a way that you engross yourself in the intellectual exercise of reason and debate affects the health of your body and your mind. Then there is the moral man. Nothing is more deleterious for the health of a man than the feeling of guilt. If a person says, I am guilty, he is so worn down by that feeling that the body cannot pick up nutrition even from the best of foods. The mind cannot be steady. Under the weight of guilt, you can never have total health. You can never be healthy. And yet, 
we are conducting our lives as moral people in such a way that we must all be guilty. None of us is perfect. There is nobody born upon this earth yet who will say he had no weakness and he was perfect. And if every weakness and lapse is going to give us the feeling of guilt, we are punishing ourselves excessively. We are not merely feeling guilty, we are punishing our health. We are causing ill health to occur where it need not occur. It is better to do something about that guilty feeling. Make amends, pay reparations, do something rather than sit with that guilty feeling on top of your head and that affects your health. One of the important causes of ill health is the feeling of guilt. And in so-called modern societies, this feeling has grown even more than it did in the oriental primitive societies. I have seen old primitive tribal communities where there is no such thing as guilt and you should see their health. They have no problems, they don't go to doctors. This is such an important factor. 90% of the people who go to doctors today, whether for physical examination or for mental examination, are inducing illness because of the feeling of guilt. To be moral is one thing. To carry the burden of guilt is another. You are a moral person if you are trying to do the good and the right thing. You are a guilty person if you can't get out of your memory of what has already happened. You are a moral person if you are living in the present and the future, pursuing a line that is closer to your objective. You are a guilty person if you are not moving in the present and future but living in the past. You have to move forward. If there is no movement forward, in a moral man's life, he's no longer moral. One can spend lifetime after lifetime in thinking over the guilt of what one has done. And everyone has done something. Therefore, one can waste entire life and become unhealthy just by the thought of this. To keep the moral man healthy, you must have a positive, futuristic approach to life. Then there is the spiritual man, the man who has the capacity to love to have intuitive experiences, who experiences joy and beauty. These things are not done by the mind. The mind can only think. The mind can only sense. The mind can only create, that means rearrange what it has thought and sensed. The mind cannot love. The power of love is immense. The power of love can generate health in a person who is otherwise wrecked and shattered. Health can be restored through love through intuitive abilities, through the experience of joy and beauty. But this power arises from that part of our consciousness we call our spirit, our soul. It is not a mental activity. In fact, the mind destroys these functions. When you think too much, you destroy whatever love there is. People who have been privileged to get knowledge through their intuitive self, they have, by thinking about how they got it, destroyed the knowledge itself and discarded intuition as a method of gaining knowledge. People who had the beautiful experience of falling in love and experiencing that togetherness, oneness, identification with another, have destroyed this beautiful experience by thinking so much about it that they created doubts, misunderstandings and ultimately rejected the experience itself. Thinking is the exact opposite of this experience of the soul, which is loving and having intuitive knowledge. Therefore, if we care more for the soul than for the mind, we should make the soul healthy. That means function in a healthy way through love, intuition and beauty. This can be done by discarding the mind at times, sitting just by oneself with the soul. We don't seem to like leaving the company of the mind. Somehow, modern civilization has brought us to a pass that we spend all our time thinking. There is not a moment when we stop thinking. There should be a time when you should say to the mind, now have a pause, I am going to be with myself, with my own beautiful self from where the intuitive voice tells me what's happening, where the love of all humanity flows out of me, where I can see the beauty of the whole and not the ugliness of the part. One should be able to do that sometimes. 
When one does that, one makes the spiritual self beautiful. Spiritual man becomes healthy. On top of that is the awareness of all these together. It is not putting one and one together. One and one is still one and one. Two is different from one and one. When you sum up a thing, you make total. Total is different from the, sum, from the individuals put together. Therefore, the total man is a higher level of awareness than merely putting these together. You have to remove the individuation that separated these men from each other before you can say you are a total person. A total person enjoys a higher level of awareness. When the awareness rises to totality, you don't feel that you have become one with your body. You already knew that. Or that you have become one with the mind. You already knew that. In total awareness, you feel you have become one with everybody else. That we are all one. That all souls are one. That all beings are one. When that awareness comes, then the total man experiences himself. With that awareness, you get a health which permeates all other bodies. So if you were to ask me, how can one achieve total health, I would say, take care of each of these layers of a human health and ultimately achieve total awareness so that you get total health. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer questions that you have on what I've said. That's a very good question, how to keep the mind quiet. The fact of the matter is you cannot keep the mind quiet. It talks all the time. What you can do is to ignore it. You cannot quieten it, but you can withdraw from it. And there is a process of meditation by which you can withdraw your attention from the mind. Like you would like to forget what is on your typewriter there or what is on the desk somewhere else. You can withdraw your attention and be here. The same process is used for withdrawing your attention from the mind itself. Today we are so much jumbled up, mind and soul. We don't distinguish. We don't even know who is who. That it takes little practice to withdraw the attention from the mind. To withdraw attention from thoughts. Let thoughts go on. We didn't listen to them. Let the mind keep on functioning. We become an observer of the mind and sit separately. In the early part of an exercise, to practice the art of separating yourself from the mind, you can sit quietly, close your eyes and watch your mind. When you begin to watch your mind, you will begin to know you are not the mind. And it will look so funny the way it is behaving. When we think that's, that's me, it doesn't look so funny. But when you start observing your own mind, it looks very funny. Such funny things it is thinking. Such funny things it's doing. You can't imagine it will do like that. When you get a practice of observing your own mind, then later on, through proper guidance from an expert, you can practice the art of withdrawing attention from the mind. Then you experience the beauty of the soul. Okay. Welcome. Meditating. Can you say the way... You learn how to do it when you want to. That's right. But, um, Meditation is the way of doing it when you want to. Meditation is the name we give to the art of withdrawing attention from anything. By meditation, we can withdraw attention from the world. By meditation, we can withdraw attention from the ugliness of the world. By meditation, we can withdraw attention from the body into our higher self. By meditation, we can withdraw attention from the mind to our soul. By meditation, we can withdraw attention from the individual in us and reach our real self, which is total. So in other words, when you feel like you're going to get really angry, you can, you can just switch off. That way That's right. You. It's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, exercise by which you can control every part of your system. You want to get angry, just withdraw. And you get the happiness and you come and then you kiss the person with whom you are mad. Immediately. It's beautiful but very few people do it. And very few people know about it. In this country particularly, very few know it. They take it as some phony yogi stuff. 
But most of us in this Western society assume that if we have physical health and don't kill anybody, uh, work daily jobs, and don't commit crimes that will land us in jail, that we are healthy. But are you? You can uh, go to the doctor and see. I have a doctor friend. I'm going to him in Buffalo. I'll be going and seeing him this weekend. That doctor is making plenty of money. When he first came, he was making only $40,000. Three years ago, I asked him, are you doing well? When there is general recession in the country, people are earning less, there are layoffs, people are being thrown off their jobs. He said, now I make $120,000. I said, how come you are making more money when other people are making less money? He said, simple. When I first came, I used to treat people who were not physically healthy. People came with that fever. If their digestion was upset, if they had a cold, if their throat was bad, if they had pneumonia, if there's something wrong physically. Now people come to me who are physically perfect. They come and they just, just ask, doctor, am I all right? And when I say all right, they pay me a fee. People are not sure whether they're healthy or not. So what has gone wrong? Physically they're all right. And he says, I am making more money in this society. It is not uh, mere physical health. That's the whole question that you have posed in this title. That uh, you can be mistaken that because you are taking the right nutrients, you are taking the right vegetarian diet, you are doing everything, you are healthy. But if your minds are not healthy, how can you be healthy? The mind affects the body in a big way. Now, how does one get out of this moral dilemma? You said a moral man must be healthy. Yes, that moral dilemma arises from the illusion of free will. This is a very interesting philosophical subject of morality. Not that only the Orientals have answered it. The German philosopher has answered it beautifully. In the critique of uh, the ethical man, Immanuel Kant has described how the feeling of morality arises from the illusion of free will. When a person says, I can do it or I need not do it, he becomes a moral man. Morality is a compulsion of free will. When you feel it is in your hands to do it, then you feel guilty. You have done it. You could have avoided it. We solve this problem by adopting a different doctrine called the doctrine of karma. We say everything is predetermined. You have no choice. Even in a simple matter, whether you will have a lemonade or not, if I offer you one, you have no choice. Because when you think you make a free choice, you are acting upon your previous preferences for lemonade or lack of preference for lemonade arising out of two sets of factors. One is based upon your genes. Maybe your father, grandfather, somebody up there like lemonade or something similar and you carried it on. Or on your environment. You were exposed to friends who like lemonade. You had a secretary who liked lemonade or something like that. But whether it was genetic hereditary factor or it was the environmental factor. The point is, when you decided to take lemonade, both these factors were fixed. Therefore, if I could feed your background into a computer, the computer would tell me in my ear before you could decide that he will decide on taking lemonade. Then are you free? If everything is predetermined in such a big way, where is the freedom of choice? Having discovered this truth that man has in reality no free will, that it only looks like free will. We evolved the law of karma, that what is happening now is just because of previous actions and reactions. We have been through an experience in the past that is affecting our decision making now. No decision is free for us and therefore we have to go through it. The problem of morality is taken care of by the solution offered by uh, law of karma. Well, some people say they are able to escape this feeling of guilt by performing an act that society may consider it to be wrong and immoral, but it doesn't affect them. Now you mentioned this, the subconscious automatically picks up this feeling. That is my experience, that even when a conscious man tries to rationalize, find an excuse, get out of it by reasoning, he still suffers the feeling of guilt in his subconscious and his health is still affected. Even though he may be unaware of the guilt. You see, this question of unaware 
He is unaware at what level? If you are talking of unaware at the conscious level, yes, he may be unaware. In the subconscious, he is aware. That is why he is having the lack of health. Guilt is worse when it is in the subconscious than when it is in the conscious. If you are feeling guilty in the conscious mind, you can find a way out. Compensate. Amend. Make amends. But if you are feeling guilty in the subconscious, your health is suffering and you don't know why. You are in nervous breakdown. You are having all the problems. Your stomach is never right. You don't know why. Then you go to psychiatrist and they pull out that event from your subconscious. They say, ah, now speak out. They give you the indicators. Try to take you back into memory and lead you to the same experience virtually which caused the guilt. You say, I feel guilty and you break down and you cry. And they said, now you won't have the tummy upset. Because this is what was causing it. The feeling of guilt suppressed into your subconscious. What about the, uh, you mentioned uh, even in this experience, the ability to cry, which is a human experience, uh, a human emotion, to ex be able to express a human emotion such as crying. Uh, a lot of people in this society uh, tend to hide their true selves, I must say, uh, the human side of themselves. And they put these massive fronts on. Uh, does this have an effect upon one's health? Certainly. The more masks you carry, the heavier the, bur heavier the burden. You are not natural when you are carrying too many masks. But modern society is functioning in such a way that you have to carry masks. You have to be hypocrites. You have to say one thing and do another. You have to feel one thing and express another. So when you are carrying too many masks, it becomes a burden upon you. And that burden your system is carrying and it affects your health. If you can take off the masks and be natural, you would be more healthy, certainly. But I guess it would take tremendous strength to unmask yourself in a room of masked people. My uh, knowledge and study on the subject reveals that uh, it is very difficult to unmask yourself but not too difficult if you do it with the help of somebody who knows how to take the masks off. This is where the whole point comes in. When you are dealing with your own consciousness, mental states, states within the body to which you have no direct access, of which you have limited knowledge, trying to do it yourself creates more problems. You don't know about it. You haven't done it. You must then get on to an adept in this science. Somebody who has gone right deep into his consciousness and into yours, and knows all about consciousness, he can tell you and help you to take off the masks. Uh, back to the subconscious. How do we get to our subconscious and make contact or dig, whatever, to find out if we do have guilt or... The easiest way to reach your subconscious is by the method of free association of ideas. The system of free association of ideas is that you put any indicator before yourself. I put these glasses before you. I said, now you keep on thinking what comes to you in the next and go on speaking out. Glasses, so and so, my mother, her friend, this. Whatever keeps on coming into your imagination, go along with it. And go on recalling and speaking it out. That way you dig into the subconscious. And if you carry out free association of ideas up to a point, at certain points you will find emotional barriers. You will not like to see what is coming before you. That's the point to pierce. As you pierce, the thing that is hiding in the subconscious will come into your conscious. It can be done very easily with the help of a psychiatrist or a psycho psycholo psychological clinicist. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Puri. Welcome.